Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. China has been working for almost a decade to impose a social credit system that monitors, rewards, and punishes people according to how closely their behavior conforms to the Chinese Communist Party standards. When they announced it proudly, they said, the social credit system is an important component of the social market, socialist market economy and the social government system. Keeping trust is glorious and breaking trust is disgraceful. Like all totalitarian regime, regimes, trust is defined by the party, which also determines what behavior is labeled glorious or disgraceful. And the consequences of breaking trust will depend on your social credit store. Well, there are a lot of us, my guest today, Todd Zawicki included, who are very concerned that the social credit scores, which have been pioneered in China for almost a decade, are coming to a house near you, maybe your house. Uh, in contrast to China, at least for the time being, the government's restrained from imposing uh, uh, social credit criteria on Americans, but they're not necessarily going to have to do it as the government. Some people believe that social credit scoring could be implemented through our, our financial services system, banks, insurance companies, credit rating agencies, um, insurance companies, what have you, and they would use the criteria to determine who does or doesn't get credit or banking services. Well, somebody who's studied this a lot is Professor Todd Zawicki, returning guest a couple of times now. Todd's great to have you here. Todd's a professor at uh, George Mason University. Uh, he's a foundation professor of law at uh, the Antonio Scalia Law School. Todd, hi. Welcome. Hey, Bill. It's great to talk with you, as always. So we got into this. You sent me an email last week about <laughs> what's going on in China, and and we're, before our very eyes, this is unfolding. There, you want to you want to tell me tell, tell us about that? Yeah, I think this potentially sums up where this might be headed, Bill. Which is um, we could talk about how this has been building, but we we can kind of see potentially end game here. Last week in China, um, what they have is a situation in which uh, some uh, rabble rousers, according to them were organizing a uh, rally um, to, uh, uh, to protest the government. So what was the first thing they did? The first thing they did was they just flipped the switch. Uh, and in China, you have to, um, they, they monitor your COVID health status. And so they just flipped the switch and everybody who looked like a troublemaker, they just turned their health codes to red. Um, and so if you've got a red health code in China because of COVID, um, then you can't leave your house or it's against the law. The next thing they did was uh, to get at these same people after that moment passed, they flipped their health codes to red um, and that was used as a vehicle to keep them from spending any money and getting access uh, to the banking system. And so what they've done now is basically used this COVID pass um, as a vehicle for controlling dissent, uh, for punishing dissenters uh, by shutting off access to their banking system and the like. Um, and it, it, the, the sort of constant surveillance we have and the constant ways now potentially that the government or powerful private actors, as we can talk about, um, can monitor our behavior. Um, we are seeing a de facto uh, social credit system evolving in this country. Um, and all we've got sort of missing right now is that last switch uh, where the government can be the one that flips the switch on us. So, so the way this worked was there was there were three banks in China, as I understand it, that mysteriously cut off their customers from access to their deposits, and some of them were, you know, in, in denominated in yuan, but in dollar terms, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, and a couple hundred of them were going to march in protest. And when the government got wind of this, that's when they turned their 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 cards from green to red. But it's not only now that they don't have access to the banking services, they can't use tr public transport, they can't go into restaurants, they can't go into malls, they've got no right to travel. So in, in effect, they've made them non-persons. Uh, and, you know, the thing, it's, 
really disturbing as our friends over at the World Economic Forum, you know, the Global Reset people, at their last meeting began talking, they had some presentations there where uh, private, private actors were beginning to roll out uh, uh, credit cards that would monitor your, your carbon footprint. And the, <laughs> right. the, 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 the obsession, of course, in the World Economic Forum is our carbon footprint, but that could be expanded, expanded a lot of other things. And they've even at the meeting rolled out, a, somebody was there with, with a really nifty new product. It was a chip that they can put in your hand if you don't want to use a credit card. And they could monitor your carbon, uh, your carbon pr footprint through the chip in your hand. Have you heard about that? Uh, I've heard, I've heard about these chips. I've not heard about the carbon footprint. But if you recall, a few months ago, they were openly discussing this sort of as a permanent monitoring system for uh, for COVID, uh, which was that if you didn't get your your vaccine then basically you could be, you know, obviously we already had vaccine mandates and passports, but they would automate the whole thing, right? And so that if you didn't get your booster at the appropriate time, um, you would have this chip in your system that would remind you. And if you didn't do it, um, then you'd be shut off from access to public locations. It's no reason to think they couldn't also tie it to your banking account uh, or all the different things we're talking about. And, and we shouldn't fool ourselves here, Bill. Like you said, the, the, the World Economic Forum obsessed with um, with your carbon footprint. But we see something like this already going on in the country, but uh, not so much on that frontier. We've seen a proto version of it, as we saw with COVID monitoring. But think about all the stuff involving diversity, equity, inclusion, or whatever they call it now, right? Which is we have people who have been accepted to colleges who then have had their their admissions rescinded because of something that was deemed uh, offensive on social media that they said when they were 14 or 16 or 17 years old. We've had people lose their jobs uh, because they didn't say the right thing about um, Black Lives Matter. We've had people lose their bank accounts, um, as we've talked about on your, your program, for not sort of towing the, uh, the party line. Um, you know, and all these things are always like, well, what about, you know, it all starts with the Nazis, uh, but pretty soon, it's you know Mike Lindell from uh, My Pillow, and it's George Will being banned from uh, from campus well, for being well, able to well, speak. Well, on that on that point, it's not just banks. But evidently, Walmart recently announced that uh, My Pillow, Mike Lindell, um, was going to no longer be carried. In, My Pillow is never going to be not going to be carried in Walmart because it had gone below their quote threshold in their rating system. And oh. they won't tell you what the rating system is. As you know, Walmart used to be Sam Walton, very libertarian, very um, government leave us alone. We're going to run business. Now they've gone completely woke and are completely engaged in, in all the agendas in Washington. And so, so Walmart has joined the fray by, uh, by banning uh, Mike Lindell's products. And hmm. you know, I guess his bank has already kicked him out as well as we talked about last time. Yeah, his bank kicked them out. And I think this is a great example, Bill, is if they're going to use these sort of rating systems. It, it, we all know now, it, it, you know, that the left makes organized attacks on books on Amazon, for example, um, to go in and, you know, they will have. I, I remember I reviewed uh, our friend uh, Peter Wallison. I uh, reviewed one of his books a few years ago. And what I was stunned was um, he had like, like, 50 negative one star ratings before the book was even published <laughs> because the left had decided they didn't want to hear that that message to be heard they didn't want wallace to be heard so they launched an organized attack uh based for purely political motives we see it on yelp um i've seen restaurant reviews on yelp that are motivated purely by people's uh, political animus um, you can just start magnifying this as if they're if Walmart's going to rely on those sorts of things, all they're doing is creating a target uh, for the uh, for the left to engage in these either direct boycotts or these indirect boycotts by these negative rating uh, processes. Well, the reason I wanted us to talk about this is I think everybody ought to be aware that this green agenda and the ESG environmental social governance and critical race theory and all the all the things that seem to want to limit our freedoms and get us to uh, toe the line with with prescribed behavior. Well, if, if they can't get it passed through legislation, they're using all these other mechanisms to do it. And the American Bankers Association has gotten together and 
and led in part by Brian Monahan at Bank of America, who's as green and as and as woke as Larry Fink is at BlackRock, and they're they're leading the charge, and they're saying, well, gee, if we can't get this done through government, the banking system is going to unite to do it through the way we control credit, and they're really already working to to withhold credit from the fossil fuels industry, you know, oil and gas companies, drillers, consultants, things like that, and. Uh, so if if you're an ordinary system a citizen and understand that uh, you know we need fossil fuels to stay in the 21st century, um, we got to start raising awareness about all these uh, financial institutions. That's right, and and one of the things people often overlook about this is that 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 you know what affects what amounts to a tax on energy that is a regressive tax. Um, you can only set your thermostat so low, right? Uh, um, you're, you explain you, explain that regressive meaning it hurts the poor people, people a lot more. Yeah, right. It hurts like poor people the most. Yeah, yeah. like gasoline is a good example. I mean, think about this sort of, you know, frankly, asinine response to the big gas cost in six dollars a gallon. Well, just buy an electric car. Right, buy a seventy-five thousand dollar electric car. Not to mention the fact that let the, our let the, highways let the, let the let them eat Teslas. Let them eat Teslas. Sorry, not to mention the fact of kind of the absurd <laughs> part of this is our highway system is maintained through gas uh, to, uh, excise taxes on gas. So the people driving around these super heavy electric cars, I don't know if people realize that they put a lot of wear and tear on the system. You know, all these rich people buying their Teslas don't even pay to maintain the highways uh, because they don't buy gas, right? And so the poor guy, you know, the guy who has to live, you know, an hour and a half from work um, and drive a uh, an older car that's not electric, um, this guy's paying huge amounts of, uh, of money for gas. He's heating his home. He's air conditioning his home. So that can only, you know, that costs so much and you can just start replicating these uh, these things. And so it doesn't affect Brian Moynihan at all to impose these costs on ordinary working Americans. Repeat, I, that's stunning. I didn't quite realize. So if you got these electric charging stations set up all over the country, which they're now proposing, um, you don't pay any gas tax on that. It's just free. You get a free ride if you're driving a Tesla, but not if you're uh, putting fuel in your 18-wheeler. Um, yeah, that's right. Exactly right. Because what is it? It varies by state, but 20, 30 something cents a, uh, a gallon uh, for uh, a gas tax. Uh, you know, some states have talked about gas tax holidays, but the electric car, the Tesla drivers don't pay any of that, yet they use the roads. Well, uh, there's this thing I wanted to ask you about. You, you, you work for what was Elizabeth Warren's monstrous creation? What's the, <laughs> the, the Consumer Cons Financial Protection Bureau. Yeah, you were. We thought we were going to shut it down. Remember in transition with Trump, we were going to get rid of it. Well, we didn't do too well there. But you were there. So, so you understand the, the whole of government approach. I mean, whole of government is where they sort of say, well, here are all the agencies. Here are your marching orders. We can't get this done through Congress, but we're going to do it through the administrative agencies. And we've got the Federal Reserve, Department of Labor, and, and Department of Justice. Department of Justice has set up a group called the Office of Environmental Justice. Right. And, and labor, you know, Trump got a regulation in, in there where he said you're not allowed to manage pension funds except to maximize the profit and returns for your investors. You're not supposed to have a green agenda. Biden's people have thrown that out. So that's back in there. They've got all kinds of non-financial criteria, including ESG. And then the Federal Reserve, I mean, I thought the Federal Reserve was supposed to preserve our money, value of our money. But instead, I get they've joined something, global network of central banks and supervisors for the greening of the financial system. <laughs> well, how do you green the financial system? Is that just, is that, is, is that just code for shutting off credit to... Uh, to industries you don't like, like fossil fuels? Uh, it's, uh, that's, that's all I can take away from it, Bill, other than the fact that the Fed seems to have uh, printed a lot of greenbacks uh, over the past uh, <laughs> few years. They create a lot of inflation. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, this is a choke point. And what it looks like is the corrupt bargain that's basically being struck, as far as I can tell, Bill, is that going back to 2008, the government has now basically made an implied deal that they're going to bail out the big banks 
um, when things go bad. Nobody believes, literally nobody believes that Dodd-Frank got rid of bailouts, right? So the big banks now understand the deal is whatever they do, they don't fail, right? And they just keep getting bigger and bigger. And in exchange, they basically play this game with the uh, with the government, right? Where they basically, you know, uh, respond to what the government wants them to do. If it's green agenda, if it's, you know, uh, diversity agenda, uh, if it's cracking down on people who um, say things uh, that they don't like, um, they are basically completely intertwined with the government, as far as I can tell uh, at this point. And um, uh, they like it. It's cozy for them. They're protected from competition. Uh, we both know, um, uh, you know, Jamie Dimon's great uh, quote that they uh, that Dodd Frank widened the moat uh, between the the for competition between the big banks and everybody else. And this is basically the world we live in, which is they basically become indirect arms of the government. Um, I think that the CEOs of these companies um, are have signed on to this agenda because it gets them a good um, a good table at Davos every year and a lot of praise from uh, from their peers. Um, and the rest of us basically don't have any choice because it's not like we're going to go out and start a bank. Well, there's something there's some there's some seeds of hope in the FinCEN space where you've got non-bank actors providing credit and some deposit services, but that's that's a drop in the ocean compared to the, the, the big, big, big banks, not, not only here in the US, but uh, in Europe uh, and uh, England and Japan. But you know, I wanted to come back to what I opened with because I, had, I wanted to find this quote from this guy. His name is J. Michael Ed, Ed Evans, and he's president of the Chinese e-commerce and technology firm Alibaba. Uh -huh. And they've developed a new technology for they call it an individual carbon footprint tracker. And <laughs> through technology and ability for consumers, it's, it's for us to do. We, we're not being coerced yet. This program would collect data on individuals about where they are traveling, how they are traveling, what they are eating, and what they are consuming. Huh. Coming to your credit card near you. Now, how they do that, I don't, you know, I don't know. But that's all these technologies are not understood until they're implemented. Um, do we have a line of defense here? Is there, as we hear about these alarming things, is there any way those of us who, who don't want our travel track to measure our carbon footprint, how do we, how do we fight back here? It's a great, that is, that's the big question, Bill, which is what I've thought a lot about. Um, and the reason is what we've seen is that th these guys are relentless. Right. The left is relentless. Like I always joke, it always starts with the Nazis, but it never ends with the Nazis. Right. Which is they go step by step by step. They have the long game. You may recall when, for example, the covid vaccines came out, they said, well, you know, including you know, the eventual President Biden, we're never going to mandate these vaccines. Right. They mandated the vaccines. We're never you know, now we've turned it, you know, like universities now um, in order to be to get hired in order to get promoted, in order to get raises, you have to not only do the traditional criteria, which is research, service, and teaching, you've got a fourth criteria now, which is what have you done personally to advance diversity uh, as defined by them, right? A particular narrow view of diversity is now necessary for your career, um, regardless of the field, and they bounce you out uh, if you don't do that. And so the left and these guys, they are playing the long game. Um, they understand it's they just kind of grind away. And so I think the lesson here, Bill, is that we all have to be much more aware of of where it ends up, not where it starts, because they always start with some reasonable little incursion. Um, and then that is used to create a precedent that expands, 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 expands. And like I said, pretty soon you've gone from the Nazis being banned on campus to George Will being banned uh, on campus. And so I think all of us at this point, you know, the joke now is what's the difference between reality and conspiracy theory about three months? Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that, that's basically where we're at with almost every single thing we can think of that they might want to do, including a social credit scoring system. We should anticipate that that's where it's going, right? So it we're talking like about... Can... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, we're talking about people who... Two thirds in, in a poll, 
two thirds of American Democrats agreed with what Justin Trudeau did to the truckers uh, in, uh, in, in Canada. 50% of Democrats believe that unvaccinated people should be rounded up and sent basically to concentration camps, right? Um, these are people who do not um, uh, uh, appreciate dissent. Um, uh, uh, it's kind of like the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, the, the logic of the Spanish Inquisition was there's no need to tolerate error. It's bad for your soul and it's bad for society. So we'll just make you recant uh, on what you, uh, what you believe. And this is basically the mindset of these people, and there's no stopping, no logical stopping point to that woke uh, worldview, uh, except complete uh, obedience. Well, that's what we mean by that's what the Chinese call glorious, right, or or disgraceful. <laughs> right, right. It's good for your soul, right? Their view is soul. that it's good for you to hold the right worldview, uh, um, not just good for society. Well, you know, Citibank's on a. It seems to be on a on a jihad against the the firearms industry. They're they're tossing all the dealers out of out of Citibank um, branches and uh, refusing to extend credit. And so it's not just the environment; it's also firearms. And you know, I just did a show with with John Lott, who's written some very long, long, long list of books he's written about guns and the fact to actually make it safer. Yeah. And, and you know, had we had concealed carry permits in a lot of in these schools, they probably the shootings probably wouldn't have happened. So there's this jihad against uh, firearms when in fact they make citizens safe. And of course, we know that the first thing you talk about Nazis, the first thing Hitler did when he took power was he took all the guns. And yep. the first thing Mao did was he took all the guns. And so that's a fairly standard playbook. Uh, one of the things I've heard is a lot of the states, though, there's some states that are beginning to pass some legislation or try to get some legislation in place. I don't think it's passed yet. Kansas has got something where they're, they're saying you can't, you can't uh, base credit decisions on subjective or arbitrary standards, and, and, the, and that they include social credit scores, political affiliations, ESG and 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 social media points, I guess tweets. I mean, they're, they're, we're trying to protect <laughs> we're trying to protect President Trump here. The right to tweet. Uh, I think Minnesota's got something in the bill, something like that. It seems like the states. I mean, you've written or you talked about the uh, the, the federalism, the, the the system of states might be the the main bulwark we have against the federal government, whole of government uh, encroaching on our freedoms this way. Yeah, I mean, we talked about this in your program, Bill, also uh, about uh, the idea that Brian Brooks had when he was acting control of the currency of the fair, um, the, you know, non-discriminatory access to credit, uh, which was designed to protect industries, but also individuals uh, through the national banking system, the states doing it. And um, here's, I think, the larger question for all of us who consider ourselves conservatives or libertarians, uh, Bill, which is that I think about when I wrestle with this, because the idea, I mean, obviously all of us have, unlike the left, all of us have principled reservations about the idea of telling banks you have to lend to this person or that person or that company or that industry or whatever, or limiting the criteria for doing it, right? All of us have reservations about, uh, about using government power to do that. But here's the thing. Um, the left has no reservations about doing that. The left is doing that, I think. So I think the argument that, well, if we give the states the power to do this or if we give federal government the power to do this, what happens if the left, you know, when it's in the hands of Elizabeth Warren? The reality is, Bill, Elizabeth Warren isn't sitting around waiting for us to tell, uh, uh, to you know, waiting for legal authorization to tell banks what to do, <laughs> right? And it's pretty clear that uh, you know the SEC and the CFTC, it's not like they're sitting around wondering whether or not they have legal authority to force these things on banks and securities firms and everything else. They're just doing it, and they, maybe courts will strike them down. Maybe maybe they won't, right? Um, but here's the question we need to ask ourselves: is is you know what what's going to change? What whatever we're doing now isn't working, right? Uh, whatever our strategy is now isn't working. So I think we need to ask ourselves: is it the case? that using these affirmative policies like you're talking about, states uh, uh, engaging in this, especially red states, 
uh, the federal government um, uh, doing it. Um, if we just swear off using the power of government to promote freedom, um, what do we got left? Every other institution in American society is taken over by the left. The only thing that's co sort of contestable for libertarians and conservatives is um, to some extent political power. Um, and so I think we really need to have sort of a soul searching discussion, which is, does this make sense? What are the pros and cons of this? Um, and what does this mean if we choose to use the kind of power you're talking about or we refrain from using the power we're talking about? But sort of the chamber of commerce idea that, uh, oh, you shouldn't tell private businesses what to do, I think is a bit naive for those of us who actually believe in uh, real freedom of this at this point, like freedom of expression, freedom to protect yourself, like you're saying with firearms, uh, freedom to, to, to work, freedom to bank, um, all these different sorts of uh, sorts of things. It may be, you know, as, as we've recognized in the past, that sometimes government um, uh, um, activity um, may be promoting freedom, and we can't just reflexively fall back on sort of thinking, well, less government uh, power is, uh, is, is, you know, inherently conducive to, uh, to freedom. So as a, as a card-carrying libertarian, you're telling me that I can't just want to have most of government melt away. We, it, may be, <laughs> it may be our only way to actually fix this, which is to get control back through the electoral process of, we've already got a lot of states that are, that are behaving sensibly, but if we get the federal government back, I mean, Trump was beginning to do this in the agencies. That's right. You, you know better than anyone that most of this bad stuff, as I just illustrated, is being done through the agencies. It's not being done through the, uh, doing through Congress. It's, it's, it's administrative fiat. So if we get a chance to handle ruling those fiats, we can roll this back. I mean, I think, you know, I know there are a lot of people now working to create a strong agenda to do just this when, uh, we get control of the White House again in 2024. Brooke Rollins has got a group. Heritage has just launched a, a group that's going to be focusing on lines of action when we win uh -huh. the election. I think one of the problems we have with the Donald was when he got elected, he didn't have a clue what he really wanted to do. <laughs> I mean, he, had, he had some good instincts, but right. he, didn't, he didn't have any people. He didn't. He didn't even know where to find the Department of Labor. Right. Um, so, I mean. You know, I, I love the guy. He was, he, but but it was it was amateur hour, and so right. now, and I, d I do think we're beginning to figure it out. I think you're saying something very smart. If we can't control K twelve, we can't control universities or Hollywood or whatever. We've got to we've got to actually use the federal government to bring about what we want to bring about, or state governments. Or state. And, and I'm, you know, and I'm still working through this bill. I think this is a discussion. But for, you know, for libertarians and conservatives to have, which is, the, you know, the the old idea of the old idea we had was there was a, a binary distinction between public and private, and all we really needed to care about was public and, uh, um, power. But if you look at the banking system, for example, to say that Citibank is a private business is kind of an abuse of the English language, right? <laughs> They're so intertwined with government, and the regulatory state just has so many different tentacles that they push it around. I don't think it's that's really a fair de description. Um, it's some sort of, we got these things that are kind of these hybrids, these amalgams. Um, and I think we need to develop our thinking in a little more sophisticated way to think about how we deal uh, with those, uh, those questions. And I do believe firmly that the long run goal here should be to get back to neutrality, by which I mean, most of the institutions of American society should be non-political, in my view. The, 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 the churches, the banks, the, the workplace, the K-12, the universities, these should be sort of non-political areas uh, where people are free to kind of, to kind of be themselves. Uh, and it may be that it's necessary in the short run to push back against power with power in order to try to get to uh, to, to that goal is uh, um, I'm I'm still working through this. I haven't concluded whether that's the case, but I think those are the kind of discussions that would be worth having. And I give right. an example. Todd, um, Todd, well, Todd, I'm going to give you a final word. We, you know, we, right. we're working on this new audio format. We're trying to get it under 30 minutes. I think oh, you good. just summarize. I think you just put together the rallying cry. Uh, <laughs> 
First, we're going to get together a self-help group of recovering, or not recovering, but libertarians to accept <laughs> this line of action. Anyway, until the next time, you'll, we'll be back. We'll be talking about this a lot more in, in the days to come. So Todd Zawicki, press, professor at George Mason University School of Law, uh, thanks. And thanks you all for listening. This has been The Bill Walton Show. You can find us on Substack, YouTube, Rumble, um, Apple, I, all, the, all the major podcast platforms. And I hope you enjoyed this and hope you'll tune in for the, uh, the next installment. So thanks. This is where you can find out what's true what's right, and what's next. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? Click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guest on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read every one, and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining.